as well. So they, they got involved as well. Um, one thing that had to happen was this, putting in all the oxygen injectors, several of them, into the turning basin to begin to... I, I think the, the Mersey was basically biologically dead by the early 1900s, just nothing in it, nothing alive, really. Um, and salmon have been caught subsequently. This story you see throughout Europe as cities have regenerated, uh, that the life comes back to the rivers as well. But I think it's just a... It's a great case study to use, and you can use Liverpool as well, you can probably use London, but I think yesterday I was at the, um, were any of you at the lecture yesterday that uh, Alistair Owens and, uh, was Alistair Owens, wasn't it, gave, and, and somebody said, where's, where's the physical geography? I think it's good to choose places where the physical geography is one of the key players, where the river is really part of the story, um, because it, it's, well, it's geography, isn't it? This is... Um, a lovely photograph as well, which the Mersey Basin campaign made a lot of use of. Once, once the, the river had been reoxygenated, uh, the ecosystems was restored, the terrible smells and the rafts of sewage had gone away, uh, an amazing thing happened, which is that the Commonwealth Games triathlon swimmers all jumped into the Turning Basin, I think in around 2002-03 this was. And these photographs uh, are, are sort of were right at the centre of the Mersey Basin's portfolio of press images. This was the image they were sending out around the world. Because I, was, I grew up in Liverpool, so I used to come over to Manchester in the 1980s um, a bit. And when we were growing up in Liverpool as well, they always said that you couldn't drown in the Mersey because if you fell in, because you'd be poisoned first. And this was the image I grew up with of, of the state of the rivers in the northwest. And I moved south and I moved down to London, like a lot of my friends from school did. And, and we left with a very negative image of the northwest, of the state of the rivers and... and and this kind of image going out around the world is very important because, I mean, it reaches out to a diaspora of people from Manchester and Liverpool and say, look, the place you left behind has changed. Come back, invest. And it, it's, the power of this image, I think, is quite central to what we see in the new specifications. So this was the Department of Education's advice about, uh, well, instruction, about what we should all be teaching. Um, and if you just, I don't know if you've seen this, have you all had a look at the document? at some point over the last year. This is what is supposed to be the learning outcomes from the study of place, uh, how demographic, socioeconomic and cultural characteristics of places are shaped by flows of people, resources, investment. So the reinvestment in Liverpool, certainly by Peel Holdings, but the mandatory reinvestment by United Utilities, as over time the water boards had to take responsibility for, for rivers, uh, that's there. Past and present connections, the way the local is embedded in the global context, well, that's clearly there in the case of our big cities that have undergone deindustrialization. The external forces operating at different scales from local to global, including government policies. The Mersey Basin campaign is an interesting example of a government policy because it wasn't a capital-intensive sum that central government put in. They just funded an office with 10 people in it for a number of years. But that organisation then helped to mobilise all of these other forces to affect the transformation. Meanings and representations, how humans perceive and engage and form attachments to places. I talked a little bit about the attachment to place I grew up with and how, like many of my generation, when there were no jobs in the North West, after we'd been to university, we didn't really think of coming back here. Um, and, and how that meaning then has subsequently changed. I, I'm, I'm astonished coming back to Manchester. I saw Affleck's Palace, which I vaguely remember from a 1986 visit, but it almost seems like a different city to me, uh, and a really fabulous, vibrant city, a place I would even consider living now. Um, and the place meanings and how external agencies create meanings and images, I do love that picture of the swimmers, and thinking about what power is in that to really demonstrate this shift from an industrial city to a post-industrial city that really has been so essential for both Manchester and Liverpool to move on. Some of this, if any of you won't be teaching A-level but will be teaching GCSE, I think you would hopefully agree looking at the GCSE recommendations here that uh, it would be a splendid case study for this as well. Um, looking at how the local and the global, it, it talks about the relationships with the wider world. Um, and just to give you an idea, this is uh, in, the, in the new EDUCAS specification 
that's the rationale for a section that will be on one of the components called Changing Places, which is obviously based around this mandatory piece of core content. And that's just to give you an idea about how, how we've managed to shape the specification. And a lot, a lot of the things I've talked about, I hope you can see reflected in there. One thing I'm going to talk about, if I don't run out of time, which I famously often do do, if I don't run out of time, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, assessment and, and what good essays are hopefully going to look like under the new paradigm of the new A-level. Um, and one thing I would just say is that when you look at some of the things here which say students might need to know if restructuring is, has, has been politically or, or commercially driven <laughs> and it has impacts on society, culture and the environment, specifications like that are not written for A-star students. That's written in accessible language. And as you can see, political and commercial are presented as an or, as separate things. And society, culture, and the environment are, are presented as separate things. But you would hope that the very best students would actually, as geographers, start to knit them together. And they would actually see that the political and the commercial go hand in hand. And again, Mersey Basin Campaign is a great example of this, the way that you've got these big commercial organisations like Peel Holdings are investing alongside the state actors and that, in fact, it's not a question of whether it's political or commercial. It's actually all of them working together in a nice little network that brings about this change. And the impacts on the society, culture and environment are, in this case study, totally... You can't pull them apart. If you don't change the river, you really are going to struggle to change the economy of the city, certainly in the central areas. So I think it's a, it's a really nice example of trying to bring everything together. Right. Second bit. Global systems. Um, did many of you, when you saw the, the, the first document, have a look at this and think, hmm, this is challenging? <laughs> I think we, we certainly did uh, when we sat down to try and um, build a specification around this. A lot of this, I think, is quite new, interdependent, some of the emphasis on global systems, on global governance. There's some quite big language in here. I've, I've been lucky enough to work with the IB over the last seven or eight years, and a lot of this we've actually already been doing uh, as part of an IB course called Global Interaction. So I, I'm myself relatively familiar with all of this. Uh, translating it, though, into a new context is a bit of a challenge. So I, what I thought I'd just do here is maybe go through some of the themes that we could all find ourselves teaching about over the next five or six years, depending on which specifications you go for, because different specifications will have chosen very different approaches here. Um, and you might find this interesting. I would expect to see all A-levels will probably have quite a strong emphasis on global interdependence uh, and on the shrinking world and on the power of telecommunications to network places together. We're actually making this one of the big thrusts of one of the EDUCAST papers, which is one of the options our cab presented to us was to use the oceans as uh, a, um, a context to look at globalisation. And that's actually really quite interesting because two of the most important flows for globalisation, container shipping flows and also flows of information through broadband cable, are of course taking place within the space of the oceans. So how that is achieved, regulation, the risks that exist to this from uh, a whole range of things like undersea landslides to piracy, it, it's a very rich area. And you've also got, in terms of global systems, the real pressure that now exists on fish stocks as emerging economies and their middle classes grow and grow, increased consumption of, of fish stocks and how you're supposed to regulate against that. Uh, there was a great photograph in the newspapers about a month ago of, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, anyone, I think it was the Indonesian minister for fishing authorised the blowing up of a fishing vessel. They bombed a fishing vessel that had come into their waters from somewhere else. So it was just an incredible image that people are blowing up other countries' ships because they're taking their fish stocks. So the, the oceans is quite an interesting area to look at and certainly understanding the, the pivotal role that broadband cables, there they are, play within all of this. I think another very interesting theme at the moment for interdependence and global teaching is this, is this overlap between energy, uh, the geopolitics of Crimea, 
and climate change in the Arctic and the way that they are all bundled up together in this, in, in this global system. 